Hey, Katie Payne. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Hearn Church. I am with Pet Relocation, and we are coming to you live from Austin, Texas. And this is my colleague, Katie Payne. She is the Australian specialist, um, our senior Australian consultant. How are you, Katie? I am excellent. I'm excited to answer some questions. <laughs> That is awesome. So um, normally, obviously, we uh, would be at our downtown office together having this call, but pet relocation, much like everyone else, is practicing social distancing and working from home these days. How have, how has that switch been for you, Katie? It was fast. The team of pet relocation really made it come together like in three days. <laughs> you know, we were ready to go, um, just like everything else yeah. we do, you gotta be quick. Uh, so it hasn't been bad at all. I do miss seeing yeah. everybody and kind of feeling it out, what everyone else is going through, um, but oh. not a bad transition. <laughs> and you got a new puppy since we started all working from home. Isn't that right? I did, I did. I uh, had an older dog who passed away and then I needed something to pour love into. Mm -hmm. So I got a new puppy who's so sweet. Her name is Juniper. And she is just rambunctious, loves Aww. to play. Her favorite thing in the world is just to really lounge on the couch. <laughs> so it's been a really nice uh, experience to have all this time with her, but she doesn't know anything else besides this. So COVID world is her oh. world. <laughs> it's been a great time for the pets. And it sounds like oh, me yeah. and Juniper have a lot in common. Oh yeah, all the dogs around the world are really thankful. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I wanted to have you here today because you are the senior sales consultant on our Australia team. And there have been a lot of changes to Team Australia. And we've been getting a lot of questions about moving pets to Australia recently. Um, even before COVID, it was definitely one of the more complicated destinations, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. Um, it's up there. Singapore, too, is hard, but Australia New Zealand is also pretty difficult because it takes so much time to prepare. You know, half of a year is dedicated to your pet's move, um, which most of the time it doesn't even take that long to move a human. So <laughs> it's definitely been a challenge pre-COVID and post-COVID. That's absolutely true. Um, so before we get started with the questions, let's kind of um, get to know you a little bit better. What, um, how long have you been working at Pet Relocation now and how long have you been on Team Australia? I've been at Pet Relo for a little bit more than three years and I've been on Team Australia just about three years. I uh, went in pretty quickly after joining the team. Mm -hmm. I had amazing people train me. One of them is our manager now. Um, I have an amazing shipping team and they all really taught me about the complexities of how to talk about the process because even in the sales process, even in the consulting process, you need to know a lot um, in order to understand where somebody is. So it, it took a while for me to learn, but once I got it, I've really only been doing Australia and New Zealand for the past three years. Nice. And moving pets, pet relocation is such a unique career path. Um, when you first started working here, what really surprised you about the industry? Well, the first thing that surprised me was that there was an industry. I did not even know that pet <laughs> shipping could become a job, um, but it is, and it's full time. <laughs> um, it really <laughs> surprised me the most was the team that we have. Um, I kind of understood that there would be a lot of rules and regulations, just like anything, but the team that we have just creates these processes that make it so much easier to do. Um, and they just go over so many different hurdles to reunite pets. And that was shocking to me, you know, that they'll work so hard to ensure that these families are yeah. reunited. And I'd never worked somewhere where everyone was so purpose driven and wanting to reunite families like that. Um, that was definitely the biggest shock. And then the second biggest shock would just be how many countries we service. You know, over a hundred countries we ship to, that's crazy. <laughs> we're, we're 35 people trying to tackle the world. Um, that's a pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, speaking of surprises, COVID-19, um, 
it turned the whole world on its head and um, the world of international relocation was certainly hit hard. Um, what has been the biggest pivot your team has seen since um, all the changes and the impacts from the pandemic? That's a good question. I would say a huge pivot that we had was Pre-COVID, our system was pretty seamless. Yes, things could go wrong, like a flight gets canceled or maybe FedEx loses paperwork. Um, but we, we did have a process in place that made things a lot easier. So a huge pivot that my team has had to go through is basically the understanding that something is probably going to go wrong. You're probably not going to get the flight you're looking for. Regulations with airlines are probably going to change. Temperature embargoes are probably going to happen. And so coming up with all of the contingencies of what we could do if something else goes wrong um, was a huge pivot. And for us to do that on the scale that we're doing it, um, you know, that flight is really long from the U.S. to Australia um, to New Zealand. And so there's a lot of risk involved if you miss even one day. And so our team has gotten really good at this in that they've created plans that have buffer days. Um, they've really pivoted to being in a mode that something will probably go wrong and they're there to fix it. Um, so I think that that was pretty remarkable. My, my relocation coordinators on my team just had to honestly overnight <laughs> kind of change our entire process from one port and one airline to wow. two airlines, multiple ports, um, and make it work for our clients that are already signed on with us and make it work for new clients that are looking to go. So it's definitely been <laughs> a process. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> flexibility has probably been a big part say. of what you're telling pet parents. Like, oh, keep yes. in mind, yes. with COVID, anything could change. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. So let's go back to pre-COVID times. Um, I think one of the most common questions that we get about Australia is the quarantine. So um, do you mind if we talk about that for just a moment? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, perfect. How, so um, a really common question is how long do pets stay in quarantine in Australia? So it's 10 nights, technically 11 days. Um, the day that a pet arrives into Melbourne in Australia uh, does not count. So it's the next day that starts as day one. Okay. Okay, great. So um, tell us a little bit about the facility. What's its name? Where's it located? And about the team that runs it? Yeah, so it's called Mickleham Quarantine Facility. It's in Melbourne or Melbourne, if you're not from Australia. Um, and it is incredibly <laughs> nice. I would say it is nicer than my house. They have uh, heated floors uh, for the winter time. So little <laughs> paws are, are always kept nice and toasty. Um, each dog has their own dog runs uh, and the facilities are very impressive and nice. It's brand new. I think it was built around five years ago, maybe three um, in that range. So it's pretty new. There used to be a lot of other oh, wow. facilities. Yeah, there used to be a lot of other ones, but then they all came together really. And there's one facility in Melbourne and that's where everybody goes. Um, and the staff there is amazing. Um, these are pet professionals. You know, they've dedicated their entire career to helping pets come into Australia, go through their 10 days, um, and then be reunited with their pet owners. So the people that work there are amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. So it sounds like um, while you're getting settled in, your pets are getting great care. Yes, absolutely. They're they're getting phenomenal care. I know that's, quarantine that's is awesome. a scary word. <laughs> it sounds like it's pet jail. It sounds scary. Yeah. yeah. It's really not. It's really not. And they don't do like crazy tests on them or anything like that. Um, it's really what they're looking for <laughs> is that they don't have any parasites on them, which they shouldn't if you go through the process as you should. Um, and they're checking paperwork and they're just, you know, monitoring their temperament, making sure they're eating water or <laughs> eating water, uh, eating and drinking water um, and that their their temperament is good. That's awesome. And um, we get asked a lot about visiting hours at Australian mm -hmm. Quarantine. So they don't allow visitation um, one of the reasons for that is it can be really stressful for a pet that is in a new environment for you to come visit them and see them and then leave and leave them there in a new environment like that. It can be anxiety producing mm -hmm. for a pet because they're wondering why you're not taking them with them. 
Um, so quarantine does not allow visitation, but they are being well taken care of. And like you said, that's really at the end of the day, just for your pet's well-being anyway. Right. Okay, great. Um, so I would say probably after quarantine, one of the main questions that we at Pet Relocation get about moving your pets to Australia is about manifest cargo. Pets cannot arrive into Australia flying in cabin with their owners, correct? Correct. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what is the most important thing to prepare your pet for that long flight in Manifest Cargo? Crate acclimation. Um, that is number one, number one, number one. Uh, make sure you do that. I know a lot of pet, pets are not crate trained. I have had many dogs that were not crate trained. I just started it with my puppy, Junie. Um, because I want to make sure that she feels safe in a crate if I ever do have to move. But that is definitely the number one component to keeping your pet stress-free and, and have the least amount of anxiety. Uh, the reason for that is pets don't know they're on an airplane. Um, pets know yeah. if they're in a safe space that they feel comfortable in, that they feel safe in. Um, you can throw like a t-shirt or an old pair of socks in there, and that will drastically reduce their anxiety. And there's a lot of different tips to get pets acclimated to a crate. You know, you don't have to have it fully assembled and just put them in there. Um, you can start with having the top of the crate not on it, you know, give them treats in there, just slowly allow them to see it as a safe space. Um, and that's a really great way to cut down on anxiety because pets want to be in a little cave, you know, they like feeling secure. Um, so yeah. doing that first step is it's the their, best way. It's their den. Yeah. yeah, I call it like their little dog castle, their little dog house, you know. <laughs> How long before the journey do you think um, bef they should start with crate acclimation? I mean, I would suggest as soon as you speak with uh, someone who is experienced in pet shipping and understand what size crate you get, um, you should get that crate and start the acclimation process. So for Australia, most of the time, clients will know anywhere between a year and I would say four months that they're, they're gonna go to Australia. So you should use as okay. much of that time to prepare your pet. Um, and so reaching out to a consultant at pet relocation, um, understanding the measurements, um, understanding that the crates that they put online are not the, the same type of uh, specs that the airlines are looking at. Um, it's all weight-based if you buy one on Amazon, but airlines don't necessarily consider weight the factor in determining what crate a pet should go in. It's their dimensions. So you wanna make sure that you're getting a crate that's large enough for the pet to turn around, to put their paws out and not have their paws or their bum touching the, the crate. And then that will be a really great way um, to, to start that process, use the same crate, um, and then they'll have a really you know safe and quick journey in their little doghouse. <laughs> I wish I could fly in large and on long flights like that in my own big crate oh. that I could stretch out on. <laughs> me, too. me too, it's the same sensation. <laughs> right? Like, ah, I would so much rather have that yeah. than have my knees hit the person in front of me. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I feel like a lot of people um, get really scared when they hear the phrase manifest cargo. They're thinking their pets are um, being treated like luggage. But uh, I would say that that's not the case. How would you answer that question for a client? I would totally agree. Um, and that manifest cargo is really where they ship precious cargo. So that means that it's climate controlled, just like in cabin, it's pressurized, just like in cabin, and it's dimly lit. So it's not completely pitch black and it's not, you know, a vibrant fluorescent light on them at all times. Um, it's, it's maybe a scary word if you ha don't have any experience with it, but it really is the safest place on a plane for a pet. Um, because, you know, in cabin, there's a lot of different noises that are anxiety producing. There's not any space. Um, in cargo, they're in that little safe dog crate and they're feeling the same sensation. Um, but the people that are handling them in and out of the airplane are all trained cargo staff. So there isn't a time where your pet is just hanging out on the tarmac. Um, most airlines have amazing pet safe policies that will take uh, pets uh, on the plane last, so they're the very last thing loaded on, and they're taken off first. So because of those different regulations, you know, they really prioritize their pets. 
So manifest cargo is the way to go. That's amazing. I, again, I wish I could just be in the cargo hold and not have to hear crying babies on a 10 hour yeah. flight. So yeah. <laughs> it sounds like they're getting great treatment down there. They are. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, so we get a lot of questions about, um, emotional support animals. Is there any exception for these kind of pets, um, that have, certificates or are for emotional support traveling in cabin with their owners to Australia? That's a good question. Um, so we have not ever seen someone get through all of the hoops that DAF, which is the Department of Agriculture in Australia and MPI in New Zealand. We've never seen a, a client be able to successfully go through that process to get an ESA animal um, into the country in cabin. Uh, there's a lot of very strict rules and regulations with how to import animals into Australia and just flying in cabin is not allowed because there's a lot of different components to the very last checks of getting an animal to Australia and New Zealand. Um, if you really feel like you might be an exception, you can reach out to DAF in Australia and MPI in New Zealand and see if maybe you qualify. Um, but we've just, it's never happened for us. Um, and we haven't heard of any clients successfully being able to do it. Uh, at this point in time, you know, Australia and New Zealand don't consider uh, an ESA certificate as sufficient enough to fly in cabin. Okay, good to know. Um, so let's go back to COVID, just like everything else right now. It is affecting, it has affected many of our moves within this company. So um, what all has of been the, <laughs> all of them? It's affected everybody's everything Everyone. in their life. But, <laughs> but specifically in the world of moving pets internationally, it's really affected um, our day to day where we can't we can't always plan ahead. What do you think has been the what's been the main thing that has been holding up moves? I wish there was one main thing, um, but there's a <laughs> lot, you know, there's a lot of different things that affect moves. Um, and I, I do try and, and show people when they first reach out to me. Um, that it's not as cut and dry as just booking a flight. Uh, there's a lot of different things that go into this process and there's a lot of people involved and agencies involved. So just, you know, as an example from our Australia moves, uh, Mickleham, which is the quarantine facility, they're operating at 50% capacity and 50% staff. So if the only quarantine facility in Australia is cut in half, that's gonna affect how many pets can do their quarantine stay. If you can't get a space in quarantine, then the flight that you're trying to book isn't applicable. So you have to find a flight, line it up with quarantine. And then because of all of that, you have to make sure that all the vet visit stuff is done, um, that there's buffer days and that it lines up, that the import permit still works. All of those different components are involved. So I would say- For all you know, of this before you even think of booking a flight. Yeah, all of that, all of that is in that's you know, crazy. the thoughts that are happening in a relocation coordinator's brain is is like 10 different things and they're all connected and one of them might not line up. So they all need to be redone. And so I would say, you know, COVID, <sighs> the pivot is really trying to put together a plan that has as much flexibility as possible for us to be able to move a date, um, push a vet visit, things like that. So there's just there's a lot of different components now that are affecting pet moves that weren't necessarily the case six months ago. Wow. And also I believe um, that our airline that we use most often from the United States to Australia discontinued their pet program. We've had several airlines, but most we specifically <laughs> we highly relied, we highly relied on uh, Qantas and yes. they canceled their pet program. What um, what has your team done to work around that? And do we have any indication of when that might they might resume their plans? Good question. So our team has actually dealt with this before. Um, two years ago, we had United Airlines and they were our number one airline to go to Australia. 
And uh, they also pretty much overnight decided that they weren't going to make that route anymore for pets. So just like we did then is what we're doing now uh, with Qantas. So we found alternative options. Um, unfortunately, all pets do have to enter Australia into Melbourne and not many flights <laughs> go into Melbourne. So with that, we can fly with Emirates and we can fly with Air New Zealand. Both of those do require a transit through another country. So Air New Zealand is clearly gonna transit through Auckland, New Zealand, and then Emirates transits through Dubai. And so with that, our team has had to make a lot of different steps of um, how to book with these airlines based on the rules that they have in place. So as an example, Air New Zealand will only allow you book allow you to book a flight 21 days out from the departure date. But because Air New Zealand is inundated with so many pets coming in, um, they're only booking one pet family per day. So those flights are very competitive <laughs> and very hard to get. Yes. Um, you see oh where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that, um, we have those two options and my coordinators who are absolute rock stars um, are trying to present these options to current clients whose move was derailed with Qantas, um, confirm all those costs, you know, figure out what's going to be the best for that family and how it's going to line up with departure. So they're really working through, you know, three move plans for one family at a time. As if moving internationally with your pets wasn't complicated enough. Yeah, <laughs> they make it a lot harder. <laughs> Is there any indication of when Qantas might continue their program? Well, I mean, we hear speculation just, you know, through some contacts at Qantas and then just online that July 2021 is when they're looking for it. But um, I will say that they did say they were going to come back uh, in July and August and that didn't happen. So um, my biggest so. piece of advice for anyone waiting on Qantas to come back and waiting for a direct flight um, is prepare yourselves for that not to happen. Um, okay. if, if you really want that direct flight, it could be a while. Um, if you have flexibility with your move date, that's great. Um, go ahead and get some of those early requirements done. Um, but waiting on an airline, just like on the human side of travel, you never want to be in that position to just wait. So definitely make sure you're uh, taking the precautions beforehand to get as much done as you can um, before waiting on an airline to come back. So have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. Yep. Or hire us right now. <laughs> hire Fat Relocation and we can watch what you What a great all. idea. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Literally, this is what we do all day long. <laughs> well, the last topic that I wanted to discuss, um, some of the frequently asked questions is about coming from unapproved countries. Australia um, divides different countries throughout the world some as the approved that you can import directly from them and some where you must first import into an approved country and on. What is what is the most some of the most common countries that are unapproved that reach out to you um, for help? Uh, Brazil would be a very big country for us. Um, one of our shippers, Nina Faber, is famous in Brazil for how well she does with shipping moves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we also we do get a fair amount of people from Mexico looking to go, and especially because one of the requirements for unapproved countries is that you do come to an approved country. So if you're in you know South America, um, Central America, most people come to the U.S. to do their stint that they have to stay in the U.S. for. Um, and then there's a lot of other unapproved countries that are um, spread out through Europe and Africa, um, and some in you know Southeast Asia. Uh, but a lot of times the transit countries really depend on how close you are to the unapproved. So for us, Brazil is a really big one. Mexico is also a pretty big one. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so they come to, if they're able to come to the United States, then we're able to assist them uh, getting onto Australia from there. Yes. Now, there is a big difference between how we handled it pre-COVID and how we handle it now. Um, because of how limited the flights are, uh, it can be a challenge to come into the U.S. and only stay for 60 days. So if you read online, if you're in an unapproved country like Brazil or Mexico and you want to take your pet to Australia, um, you'll read that you, know, you only need to be in an approved country for 45 days. Um, I will tell you that that is 
very unlikely that it's going to be 45 days because you have to do everything very, very quickly. And every entity involved has to do everything they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. So most of the time that doesn't line up. Um, and what we tell people is, you know, we need a minimum of 60 days. And if we can get your pet all done, everything's done, we can confirm everything. Of course, we want to shoot for the soonest possible date possible. Um, soon as possible date possible. Um, but most of the time it does take at least 60 days if you're coming from an unapproved country to the US and then going on. So just like everything else, flexibility is important. Yes. 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 Flexibility. <laughs> and if the pet owner can't stay in the United States with their pet for 60 days, can we assist with um, providing a caregiver or boarding? Absolutely. So we can um, assist with long-term boarding. We also have amazing vets on staff that can come out to the facility that we use in LA called the Kennel Club. Um, we have a really great team there. Uh, we have vet, uh, our vet, Dr. Landa comes out and he will do all the treatments. Um, he'll expedite it to make sure it's done as quickly as possible. So if we do need to board, we can definitely assist with that. But of course, the most affordable option is going to be either coming to the U.S. with your pet or if you have someone in the U.S. that's willing to watch your pet for two months. Um, those are the best options because they're the most affordable and it's a little bit easier um, just, you know, in terms of the logistics of trying to get your pet. Great. That is so good to know. Well, I know that you are very busy. Do you have any last lasting advice that we didn't cover that you would like to um, give to our watchers? Uh, yeah, I think my biggest piece of advice would be give yourself as much time as possible. Um, we ask for four months to plan moves to Australia and New Zealand. I know that it says everywhere it takes six months. Um, I would plan for eight if I was in your shoes. Everything's taking a lot longer. Routing is a lot more difficult. Um, but if you do have concerns, if you do want to talk with somebody, you know, reach out to us on our website, fill out a form. I'm really here to help and answer any questions that you have. And I want to get you to a point where you feel safe about this relocation and that then we can get started and I can hand you off to our relocation coordinators who all they do every day is reunite families with their pets. And we really want to be able to help you. That's amazing. And you, they can also send us a message here on Facebook and we can help them from there too. Yeah, Team Katie. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. Have a great rest of your day. And I hope this was helpful for everybody. Thanks, Katie. Bye.